Good afternoon, Restoration 18th Century Theater lovers and scholars, and welcome back to the R18 Collective's Interview with the Author series. The goal of the series is to highlight research in the field of restoration in 18th century theater and performance studies, and to provide a venue for scholars to share some thoughts and reflections on their recently published work. My name is Lisa Freeman, and it is with great pleasure that I am here today to talk with Professor Laura J. Rosenthal about her new book, Ways of the World, Theater and Cosmopolitanism in the Restoration and Beyond from Cornell University Press. Professor Rosenthal is professor of English at the University of Maryland and is known to many of you both as the editor of the journal Restoration and as a longtime leader and prolific scholar in the field of restoration in 18th century theater and cultural studies. She is the author of Playwrights and Plagiarists in Early Modern Drama, Gender, Authorship, Literary, Literature, Literary Property, apologies, Cornell, 1996, and Infamous Commerce, Prostitution in 18th Century Literature and Culture, also from Cornell in 2006. In addition to these monographs, she is also the editor of Night Walkers, Prostitute Narratives from the 18th Century from Broadview, 2008, and co-editor with Mita Chowdhury of Monstrous Dreams of Reason, Body, Self, and Other in the Enlightenment from Bucknell, 2002. Professor Rosenthal is a past recipient of a Newbery British Academy Award for Research in Great Britain, the Monticello College Foundation Fellowship for Study at the Newbery Library, an NEH Summer Award, and a Folger Shakespeare Library Short-Term Fellowship. In her other daytime job, Professor Rosenthal serves as the, ed as the director for, fa for faculty leadership in the Office of Faculty Affairs at the University of Maryland. As noted earlier, we are here today to talk about her new book from Cornell Univers University Press, Ways of the World, Theater and Cosmopolitanism in the Restoration Theater and Beyond. Welcome, Professor Rosenthal. Let's get to some questions. Thank you. So, yeah, good to see you today. Um, my, my first question I, I wanted to ask you, Laura, was, um, you know, what was the initial insight that sort of sparked Ways of the World? And in what ways did you find that your ideas evolved um, and your arguments emerged about restoration theater and cosmopolitanism um, while you worked on the project? Yeah, thanks for that great question. And thanks so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, it's just um, uh, great to, uh, and thanks for anyone who's, who's watching. Um, so, the fact that the restoration is a period of great cosmopolitanism, like obviously I'm not the first one to say that, right? It's kind of the first thing you think of when you think of the restoration. But I really wanted to kind of think about what is, you know, what does that really mean? Like, why are they so interested in so many other regions of the world and in that particular period? And so I think of the scholarship as kind of in a very early initial phase, where there was a lot of interest in ideology and as a kind of way of, you know, an emerging English nationalism as defined against these other regions. And, but, but then all these like really interesting books started coming out about how, you know, like I'm thinking of um, um, Bob Markley's work on China and um, also David Porter on China and Nabil Matar on the Ottoman Empire and Gerald McLean on the Ottoman Empire and all these people writing about ways in which the English were actually like in great admiration of other, of other nations and they weren't expressing contempt toward them. And, um, you know, and Alok Yedov talked about how England thought of itself as a backwater in relation to other European nations. And there was just, that, that was just so interesting to kind of put that against this ideological critique, which was saying, you know, really they're developing um, a, a sense of national superiority that you can see in the British empire. So, so I was kind of suspicious of this idea that there's like a straight line from the restoration moment to the 19th century empire that Britain becomes. And the restoration is such a fascinating moment in which you know, nobody can really predict what happens, what happens later. Um, and so, so, so when, when the plays kind of engage these, like you never quite know, like for example, when there's a depiction of slavery, is it, are they you know, drawing from Roman slavery? 
is it Ottoman slavery? Is it, you know, Popish slavery, which you hear them talk about all the time, you know, we're all gonna be enslaved by France and the Pope. And so I, I was also sort of taken also, this is a conversation I think um, Alokiato started around England thinking of itself as not being very sophisticated. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And so I, I, so I really took kind of a deeper, a deeper dive into that and noticed how this was like a huge anxiety that they're not as sophisticated as these other nations. Um, and so, so what it, to answer the part about what changed along the way. Um, so I think eventually I wanna say there were, there were two things that, um, that I want to realize that when we look at these plays that engage other nations in England, we're really seeing just the tip of the iceberg. And what's under that iceberg is, is like a lot of violence. It was under that iceberg is really distressing. And so, you know, we like to say trade, but I've preferred Sven Beckert's term war capitalism because they didn't go to other places like here, you take this and I'll take that. You know, they were always accompanied by like really big guns and it was, and it was violent and all these wars that we heard about, like all these Dutch wars, you know, I started reading about how the theaters of war were, yeah, they were in Europe, but they were also in Africa where they were fighting over these slave forts that you know the Portuguese had built and the Dutch had taken over and now the English were trying to get from the Dutch. And so, so all these things that we think of as the rise of mercantilism, what we're seeing is the tip of the iceberg. And so then the second insight was <laughs> that people who went to see the place at the time saw the whole iceberg or they saw a lot more of the iceberg than we saw mm -hmm. and so the plays weren't really about like sort of wacky party animals which is sort of the way we have you know that's an exaggeration of mm -hmm. some ways in which we see restoration drama and that there were actually like very serious issues they were engaging and they weren't necessarily engaging them in an ideological way and they weren't necessarily engaging them in a way that was not critical. It's like a lot of a lot of double negatives. But one thing <laughs> I, I, I feel is like, you know, the Stuarts were really vigilant about what was allowed to be published in print. Yeah. And I think people got away with stuff yeah. off the stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, you know, I, this brings me to the, uh, the question I had for you about, uh, about um, history and how it informs your work. I mean, there, what I what I noticed as I read through your book is that you know you're really taking a pretty powerful, strong um, stand about historicity, right? And and from what you're saying, you were just saying, right? It's really important to kind of take apart some of the assumptions that have been baked into how we read restoration drama um, to really think about the awareness that audiences had, right, about a sort of vast panoply of historical <laughs> events in their moment as well as how they, they understood those as like historical memory. Like, I, I really love the way that you, you, you talk about in, in a number of your readings, how audiences would have been able to recall right, this event or that event or this public figure or that public figure. And I think that's totally true. And, and so I want you to say maybe just a little bit more because I think you also just spoke about that so eloquently moments ago, you're like what's at stake for you and how we are engaging history, you know, in our work on restoration and 18th century drama? Yeah, well, I guess, I mean, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, first of all, I want to say that I don't think everyone has to be quite so deeply historical. Like, it takes like a really long time. <laughs> and, yes. and you have to like read a lot of a lot of other stuff. Um, so I don't think every, and, and I think there is a case to be made that, you know, some literary works are, you know, for all time and they speak to us and we make them our own. And I, I think that's totally okay. But I also have come to feel that if we talk about these um, really volatile issues like race and gender and slavery and colonialism, we really need to be responsible to what was going on in the moment and, and kind of have an understanding of what, of what that means. So I feel like for certain topics, the kind of broad historical sense is just a huge advantage because 
it, it really kind of keeps you from, you know, we're, we're, we've all been raised to this wig version of history. You know, we're so much more insightful than anyone ever has been in history. <laughs> And, you know, so, and, and, and I think that there's just a lot of things that there, there is just a lot more tension than it looks like there is if you don't know what's going on historically. And sometimes there's even like, I mean, it would be a little too far to say that's encoded, but I think there were things being signaled between the plays and the audiences that you really, that you really have to reconstruct mm -hmm. in a way that when you go to the theater now, there's just so much that is really elliptical and you don't even realize that your brain is filling in all these like 10 different steps of how the characters got from A to B. And, and then you go to a restoration play and you're like, like how did they get from A to B? <laughs> that makes no sense. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think what you're what you're saying, you know, what one of the arguments that your book, you know, ultimately makes across a series of readings is the extent to which an audience understood themselves as encountering a kind of global stage, um, and thought of themselves as this emerging, you know, global set of events, um, not just a national, not just on a national front, and. Um, so um, that so that our understanding of how those events sort of um, unspooled is kind of imp is important to under understanding many many of what's much of what's portrayed on the restoration stage. So um, I wanted to ask you too about about the, the importance of female figures um, in your in your work because um, they're clearly central as historical figures, as actresses, as characters. And, and in many ways, um, you, you often flip the script in your reading. You're saying, well, you know, in, in our reading of this play, we often focus so much on the male protagonist. But actually, if you look at it from the perspective of the female protagonist, it's a different play. Um, and we can, you know, we can have, um, we can take away different meanings. And so I, I just wanted to sort of ask you about, you know, how you came upon these types of insights and, you um, you know where you think restoration drama was going was going with these figures yeah i mean that that's a great question because i weirdly i sort of felt like this was the one book that i wrote that wasn't like deliberately <laughs> about women and gender because that's been so much of my career but of course you saw it it was there anyway it was there despite <laughs> yourself <laughs> but but i actually have to say that i feel very strongly that I didn't put it there. I think I just saw it. Mm -hmm. I did because of the work that I've done in other areas. I just think it's totally just there, mm -hmm. and that I'm, and that you know, like for one example is, um, you know, like the uh, like a female icon of the restoration. Maybe for us, you know, when you're first introduced to the field, would be Nell Gwyn, you know, but you know, like. Peeps actually had a sexual fantasy about Catherine of Braganza. Did not have a sexual fantasy about Nell Gwynn. And so I know that's like not like the greatest barometer of historical importance, granted. But I still think that if you that that we've just kind of lost because of layers, well, partly because of the 18th century, as I kind of try to explain at the end, that the 18th century kind of closed off with the fullness of what mm -hmm. the restoration really meant mm -hmm. but that i think you know you have this um you know charles is married to this woman who is um you know doesn't speak english is foreign is from a once you know allied with some powerful forces uh the first first uh european nation to enslave africans part of her dowry was paid in sugar, you know, the mm -hmm. little nursery rhyme, sugar and spice and everything nice. Some people think that was actually about Catherine mm -hmm. because she was small <laughs> and she was, um, her dowry was paid in sugar. And so, you know, we kind of, she, you can't find a book on Catherine in English. I mean, I'm, you know, I, somebody out there who's Portuguese needs to, you know, and, and also in English needs to work on this. But I think, um, so, so you have this woman and then you have all these plays about these scary foreign women. <laughs> so, yes. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> make, make the connection. No, I think you make a really compelling case for her as a pivotal figure and a, as a pivotal figure who's haunting um, the plays and haunting the sort of transformation um, of England, right, from an island nation into a global empire. She brought not just, as you as you point out in the book, not just sugar, but 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 access to both the East and West Indies, um, access to uh, the slave trade in Africa, um, and so this is in some ways a very strategic, right, but also a, a very very complicated. Uh, marriage um, that was negotiated. Um, and as you say, the outcomes were not yet guaranteed and how that was sort of uh, brought in or experienced by the English um, is, is, uh, is, is an interesting tale to see you work through as they, as they watch these plays um, and engage these foreign figures um, on the stage um, in these tragedies and um, across the sort of repertory. So speaking of the repertory, um, uh, at these R18 interviews, I always like to ask of all, I think I know what you're gonna answer from reading your book, but I'm not 100% sure, but of all the plays you write about uh, in your book, which one would you like to see staged today? Well, first of all, I'd say that a lot of the plays I do write about actually are staged, you know, like the, the Country Wife, The Man of Mode, The Way of the World, all those get performed. That is although, true. Although, you know, speaking of women and gender, I think they're often performed in a way that doesn't really capture mm -hmm. the, their, their power because they tend to have a, um, they tend to, modern people tend to underestimate what these female figures are doing and what they mean. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, I, I think you, pr you probably guessed that I'm gonna say this, but, <laughs> but, you know, The Morning Bride. <laughs> That's Tom, what I was going to guess. <laughs> is just an incredible play. I mean, yeah. we all know, Congreve from the way of the world. But in the 18th century, this, you know, he was he was famous for a guy who wrote, he was famous as a guy who wrote a tragedy, oh, and, and then a few comedies. But he wrote this great tragedy that stayed in the repertory for the entire 18th century and was played over and over again. And, you know, Samuel Johnson said that, you know, it was better than Shakespeare. I mean, this is, this is how Congreve became Congreve. And yet we've completely forgotten about this play. And maybe someday someone who's, you know, maybe you <laughs> um, could, could <laughs> sort of find out like, when it fell out, you know, yeah. like that's what I don't know. Like how, mm -hmm. you know, because I, this is just like the way databases are divided. <laughs> you know, I could trace it up to the 18th century, but I don't know what happened afterwards. Yeah. Um, but it's such a, it's such a fascinating play because, you know, you, on the one hand, it kind of has a feeling of being, you know, maybe this is um, like an expre expressions of, of nationalism, but it's such, it's not triumphalist at all. It's mm -hmm. very dark. It's very bitter. It is very much bringing to the surface all of the exploitation that is part of the um, imperial and slave trading proje project. Mm -hmm. And it's really kind of um, just, a, just a, a, a fascinating play and deeply, deeply skeptical and not at all heroic and kind of depending on, as you said before, audience rem audiences remembering Dryden and what a hero is supposed to be. And Alfonso really is very much not that not yeah. that guy. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, no, I think it's a powerful play and, and um, I love the way you discuss it. And I think it would be great to see it performed, right? As a way of reflecting, again, taking apart the assumptions that the, the restoration is just this jolly good time and um, one big <laughs> sex comedy, um, which it was not. Um, there were so many serious um, issues taken up with so much ambivalence uh, and um, conflict. So um, yeah, I'd love to see that as well. Um, what's next for Laura Rosenthal? Because I, I love your work. I love hearing what you're working on. What What's next? Yeah, that's a that's um that's a challenge. Um, <laughs> when you're not when you're not wearing your administrative head, you know, yeah, mental um, as it were. Yeah, I I know you and me both, right? <laughs> um, so so in my experience, projects always 
start out like incredibly ambitious and then they get tamped down to a manageable size. So I'll tell you the ridiculously ambitious version and then you'll check in in a few years and see what little piece of it I've been able to manage. But one thing I really, this is actually not really a theater project, but I'm really interested in the, the philosophical fascination in the 18th century with kind of ground zero of humanity. And so they're really interested in people coming out of the state of nature and into being civilized. And then there's a lot of discussion of their passions that are that are part of this human human condition, but it, they only happen post agriculture. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just really, you know, so I've been reading actually like a lot of philosophy lately, like Hobbes and Mandeville and mm -hmm. Locke and Hutchinson and Hume and Smith and, right. and trying trying to get at this kind of um, and and definitely, you know, and you see this also in Defoe. And you see this in um, some other novels as well, but I'm kind of starting, um, starting with philosophy and like, and and of course, you know, once you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. You know, I was just like casually reading like, you know, Mark Mark Bittman's new book on food, and and he talks about how you know agriculture was the biggest mistake ever, <laughs> and so. So I'm just really interested in how like contemporary environmental theorists are so interestingly like aligned, maybe backwards, maybe not, with this 18th century kind of state of nature argument. Interesting, interesting. So, all right, that's <laughs> that does sound like a big project, but it sounds really fascinating, and um, I will look forward to seeing what you do with it. I hope it remains large. <laughs> Um, or as large as it can be, um, given given the limits of time. Um, but I, I want to thank you so much, Laura, for talking with me today and for sharing your work uh, with uh, everyone in the Restoration 18th Century Theaterverse. And um, we'll look forward to, um, you know, sharing this work and um, hopefully to hearing more from you at uh, conferences to come and in publications to read. So um, thank you and have a great day. Thank you, you too.